Our first speaker for Sunday is uh, an engineer and a Japan enthusiast and past bill speaker returning to our stage. Please welcome uh, Mason Simon. Morning, everybody. Get this a little higher. All right, well, I went to Japan recently for the second time, and uh, like Faye said, I'm a Japan enthusiast. So I'd like to just share some of my enthusiasm with you. I, I promise it's not just my travel photos, it's the quirky sort of things that I hope you'll appreciate. So this is the photo that started it all for me. I was just taking a bunch of photos on my trip and uh, sharing them with my friends on Facebook, and I saw this one and I thought, uh, well, just take a, take a moment to look at this, and I hope that you'll see what I see. Yeah. So do you notice anything about this? Exactly. So there are a number of failure modes of toilet paper dispensers in public bathrooms, and this one solves all of them as far as I can tell. All right, so the first thing to see is the role of toilet paper here. There's actually no cardboard interior. Oh. Okay, how's this? So when you finish pulling the last piece of toilet paper off of this roll, it's gone. Something very zen about this. But here's the best part. You just slide the next roll over. There, there's no, like, there's no moving part. There's no spare roll of toilet paper that's just sitting out on a counter somewhere. It's securely stored inside of its canister, but it's only accessible when you're ready for the new roll. What's that? Yeah, th there's no cardboard tube in the middle. And so the, you know, the metal rod is just aligned perfectly with the hole of the next roll. So you pull the second roll out of the hole, and then your third backup just drops under the force of gravity. So this, I look at this system, and I'm like, can this person please get elected to Congress? Because they just designed the ultimate system for dispensing toilet paper. They know how to build systems that work. This is literally iron law. The way that this system works is entirely governed by the design of the metal structure here. I just, I get chills thinking about this. <laughs> Maybe I'm weird. So, you know, I shared this with some of my friends and they found it interesting and that got me going on all the other cool, well-engineered things in Japan. So let me give you some more. Uh, oh, to give a little, like, theoretical framework for the talk, though, since it's, it's basically a random slideshow of stuff that I thought was cool in Japan, but I'd say this is the underlying theme, which I took from this book by Donald Lorman. When you interact with a device in the real world and something goes wrong, a lot of people, they have this attitude that I screwed up. But the thing you get when you read this book by Donald Norm is that you didn't screw up. You're just interacting with a system that's not engineered well for humans. All right, so the Japanese totally get this. So here's something I found just amazing, like going on the uh, bathroom sort of theme. Uh, this is a storm drain, but you can see it's not like a, a straight extruded rectangle. It's modular. So each of these little buckets just fits into the next. I'm not sure if you can see it with the lighting, but uh, they're just attached with screws. So you could go to a store and you could buy 50 of these, and it doesn't matter how, how long your, uh, or I guess how tall your roof is. You just, you know, attach as many as you need to. I thought that was pretty cool. Let's try another one. Does anyone notice anything about this drinking fountain? Yes. So they all drain into this huge drain at the bottom. But you can see there are these nice little cutouts. So uh, although there are three fountains here, they all drain to the same place. And when I look at this, I think back to this uh, drinking fountain experience I had in San Francisco where I get to the drinking fountain thirsty because I'm out running and it's a hot day. And the drain is clogged because some, some kid threw sand into it. Well, I mean, that's just the sort of thing that's going to happen in a large-scale system, right? There are 40 million people in Tokyo. Someone's going to put sand in something. Uh, but this is a huge drain you're dealing with at the bottom, so it can handle it. Like, 
this is a very low maintenance system. I, I will admit though, just so you don't think I'm a total like lover of all things Japan, there's one thing that does seem like a flaw to me here. One of my friends pointed this out. When you turn these fountains, the water goes straight up. So the water actually falls back down on the spout. So if someone's got a cold and they're drinking from this thing, maybe you pick it up. I don't know, I'm not a biologist. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, this is the park actually, the entrance to the park where I took the photo of that drinking fountain. So one thing that you see in parks is they're public spaces and you know, for the most part, I mean, ignoring this one, mostly we don't pay for parks in the United States. And I don't know, have you ever had this experience where you give someone a gift and you, you thought about it, you're like, this is a really good gift for this person. But then when they get it, they just treat it like crap. Like so, what's that? What's it called? called Red of shame? Red of shame. Hmm. Well, it, I think the point is basically, when someone gets something for free, they don't value it. So, what's the solution? Charge a little bit of money. And this park, it costs less than a subway ticket. It's like one to two dollars. So, probably everyone can afford this. If you can't afford it, then it, maybe the society should work on making sure everyone's got enough to get into the park at least. So, so in addition to making people value their experience in the park, there's another consequence, which is that you can close the park at night. So you don't have to worry about kids you know, vandalizing your park because they can't get in. And this is a really big park, but it's, it's totally doable to get it off. So I thought that was pretty novel. Oh, and your access is extremely high tech. You go to a ticket booth, uh, you put your money into the machine, you get a ticket with a QR code, and you scan it on this gate. It's fully automatic. Okay, so speaking of great ticketing experiences, here's a fast food restaurant in Tokyo. And there are a number of things going on here. So on the right, you've got your machine where you punch in your order. So the cashier has been automated out of existence in Tokyo. Not, not everywhere, but in this fast food restaurant. So you put in your order on the screen and then uh, that prints a ticket after you pay. And down at, I guess I should use my laser pointer. So this thing right here, this is a transit card reader. So your same ticket that you used to get on the train system, you can use to buy your, it's not a hamburger, but like your meat and rice bowl. So you get a ticket, you give it to the person behind the counter, they give it to the cook, who then gives you your food. It's very streamlined. Okay, next thing. Uh, this is where you sit. So your food goes up here, your legs go down here, but there is an additional cubby to put your belongings because you're walking around a city, you got stuff. Are you just gonna stick it on the table or the floor? No. Nice, neat spot for it. There's also a power outlet here if you need to charge your phone. Okay, and then top left, this one. I just couldn't get enough of this. So you go to a restaurant here, maybe they give you a pitcher of water, and it's ice water, right? But it's warming up. So why not just make a, a vacuum here and save a little heat? Right? It's brilliant, it's totally cheap, you know, it's made out of plastic. And it's just unequivocally better than the non-insulated water pitcher. Why don't we do this? I don't know. Housing, all right. Maybe it's better down here in LA. I just moved out of San Francisco and I cannot tell you the number of times I went apartment shopping in San Francisco and I showed up to some weird, crazy little layout where you know, my small number of square feet are divided in a totally nonsensical way. So why did I waste 30 minutes of my life going to this apartment in the first place? If they just listed a floor plan, I wouldn't have gone. So throughout Tokyo, you have apartment rental agencies and they have their listings just out front on a little sign and they all have a floor plan and all of the data that you need to make your decision. You know, like, how is it, does it have a living room, dining room, kitchen? How many rooms? How many square feet? It's wonderful. We should do this. Let's keep going. So that's, that's more permanent housing. Now let's talk about temporary housing. So in Japan, you've probably heard of these things, but if not, I'm going to tell you about them, called capsule hotels. Capsule hotel is what happens when you factor all the common components out of a hotel room into common spaces, and then you just make the most efficient possible temporary housing. So what you get is this little, it's like a, a one meter square and about two meters deep. I'm gonna use meters because they use them over there. 
uh, it was tall enough for me, but it's a little bit small. I'm a hair under six feet. And they're double-deckers, so this is one on the upper level. There's also one below. So extremely dense temporary housing, and it's cheap. This, uh, I got one of these rooms for 15 bucks a night in the middle of Tokyo. Uh, and this was not like a, a low-quality place. This was great. So when I said they factor out all the common components, that includes bathrooms. So you go to a common bathroom and also the bathing area. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you photos of the bathing area in Tokyo, but they have a concept called the onsen, which is just incredible. And if you ever go, you have to try one. Uh, it's, it's an area where you go, you scrub down, so you basically bathe and cleanse yourself first. Then you go and you sit inside of a hot tub. It's a wonderful way to start the day. And this hotel had an onsen built in. It's great. All right, let's keep going. Uh, there are systems that manage everything in Japan and manage it very nicely to reduce your stress as you go about your daily life. So one thing you might be stressed about is, oh, I bought a nice umbrella. Uh, I can't bring it into the store because that would be inconsiderate and someone might slip. I have to leave it outside, but what if someone steals it? Well, you've got lockers for your umbrellas. Why not? Okay. Uh, all right, I think it's too bright to see this one. You can see the key here, though. So the onsen that I just mentioned, the hot springs, it's a great tradition in Japan. And these exist not just inside hotels, but also separate businesses. So here's one that I went to. Uh, and let me just describe to you the system of going through this onsen. You, you come to the building, and then before you even enter, there's a locker to place your shoes into it. So you put your shoes inside, and then you get this key. So here's the key for the locker. But you can see it's also attached to this weird like rectangular card with two notches taken out of it. So here's what that card is for. You take your shoes off to go inside the building so you don't get it dirty. Then you get your towel and all the gear you need to bathe in the onsen. You go into a locker room. So there's an additional set of lockers inside the locker room where you place your clothing. All right, You put all your clothes inside. So now you're naked carrying a towel. and. Uh, you have a key for this locker. Well, actually, you haven't gotten the key for the internal locker yet. I'll get to that. But it, obviously, it's locked by a key. So think of the fa failure mode here. What if you're bathing, and somehow you lose the key to that locker? Wait, wait, wait. Let me back up. Now, ah, OK, here was the thing that you don't want to happen. What if, you, what if you lose the key to your shoes locker? So you're done bathing. But then somehow you've misplaced the key to your shoes locker, and you're so relaxed, you forgot about it. So you get all your clothes on, and then you have to go back out in the city, but you have no shoes. Well, that would suck. So they've actually made this impossible, and here's how. This little notched card, this is another key that goes into the back of the door on the clothes locker inside of the locker room. And until you've engaged this key in the back of the door, you can't remove the key from the clothes locker. So it is impossible to lock the locker that contains your clothes until you've proven that you have the key to the shoes locker. <laughs> I thought that's pretty cool. So this is a theme that I saw in Japan. There are, there are things that can go wrong in life, and some people worry about those things. I'm definitely one of them. I'm very aware of the ways things can go wrong. And they have found ways to eliminate all of these concerns. This totally Unrelated, we're on a new topic now. I was just walking around a park on the outskirts of Tokyo, and I came across this. And uh, I, I just thought this was a really neat concept. So at my old apartment building in San Francisco, uh, we'd have the waste management trucks come around at like 5 in the morning on Tuesday. And I could hear them, uh, which is annoying. Like, I'd rather not hear the garbage trucks all the time. And then I saw this thing, and I was like, well, what's going on here? There's, this is a residential neighborhood with a bunch of single-family homes, but they all bring their trash to a central location. So it, it's kind of like they were in a big apartment complex, except they have separate homes. And I'd never thought of this before, but why do we expect the garbage truck to come right to your door? I mean, if everyone just brings their trash you know, 50 feet away from them, it's going to save time on the garbage truck's route. They don't have to pick up a bunch of individual small cans. They just pick up one big can. And it's, it's a pretty small ask for all the residents there. So it's a different way of doing things. If you don't, don't imagine that everything has to be full service, but maybe you give a little bit of your own you know, individual time, and then the social benefit 
it comes back to you and it's greater than what you put in. That's a theme I saw. Here's another theme that I noticed. Everything in Japan is nicely decorated, at least where I've been. Uh, the way I describe it is decoration is not optional. So when you have 40 million people packed into a small space, you know, you could have some shitty, plain iron manual cover, but why not make it beautiful? And then you've just improved the lives of 40 million people very cheaply. And they do this. They have fantastic designs. This is just a sample. I've probably got 50 photos of manhole covers. <laughs> and one of my friends who went to Japan before me, he saw this and he's like, oh yeah, let me share with you my photo album of manhole covers. <laughs> so I'm not the only one. Oh, they do, yeah. I'm not sure about the significance, like whether they're very based on the type of cover they are, although I know the ones covering a little like electrical hold, they have TEPCO's logo on it, but they vary based on the location. So a lot of these will have uh, like the name of the district they're in. There we go. Okay. Uh, I've, there's no significance to the image here unless you're an anime fan, but I just wanted to blur out the faces of people who were in this photo because I didn't know where it's going to show up on the internet. Okay. But the faces are not the point. The point of this photo is what they're sitting on. All right, does anyone notice? Can you see it well enough? So people are sitting on these metal tubes. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, it's not quite as comfortable as a bench, but it works. And then I started thinking about it. So like I have mentioned before, I used to live in San Francisco. Uh, a big problem there is people, you know, like sleeping on stuff in public spaces. You can't sleep on this. Like, how are you going to sleep on this? It's just the system, like the laws of physics and the makeup of the human body make that not a thing. No one's going to sleep on these railings. Here's another thing. You can't dump trash on it. Like if you spill a drink or it rains, there's no, water is not going to pool. You don't have to worry that you sit down on this thing and you get like Diet Coke on your pants because it's just going to slide off. All right? Easy to clean. Uh, and it does more. So you can see there's no street parking here. So one argument for having street parking is that the cars provide a barrier from the other cars that are actually driving down the street. Okay, these metal railings, which are benches, they protect pedestrians in case the car loses control. It can't go on the sidewalk. And it protects the tree too. So it's like, this thing's brilliant. It's solving like five problems at once. And look how much seating it is too. I mean, you could probably, you could easily fit 50 people onto, you know, like 60 feet of this stuff, maybe 100 feet, whatever. Uh, th think how many benches you would need to accomplish that and they would take up more space too. Okay, so that was butt parking. Now here, we're gonna talk about bike parking. Uh, so on the image in the left, all they did is they just angled the, uh, the bike parking slots and now the bikes don't stick out so far into the sidewalk. It's simple, but it's cool, right? And then this one on the right, you can see that they are vertically staggered. So you can pack in more bikes because the handlebars are not gonna run into each other. Also smart, you know, when you live in a dense environment, you have to figure out ways to make it work, and they have. But that was not real bike parking. This is real bike parking. Have you ever seen double-decker bike parking? What? Uh, Amsterdam. Amsterdam, okay. I haven't really traveled that much in Europe, but okay. So other cultures get it too. This blew my mind. Let's move on to car parking. Do you see what's going on here? Yeah. All right. So you've probably, if you've been to New York City or other big cities, probably LA's got it too. You see these parking lots where you can drive in and there's a little car elevator. Maybe you can fit like three cars high. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Well, anyway, so I've seen these in New York. Rather, I, I've seen the, the kind I just described in New York. But those are all really big structures, they're made out of I-beams, they look like, you know, a crew of people had to put those things together. This thing, well, you know, I imagine you could probably fit one of these things on the back of a, a small semi-truck. So that's cool. And there's also just one of them. I mean, there's a lot of significance to that. So has anyone here read this article, The Perverse Effects of On-Street Parking? Let me try to summarize it really quickly for you. 
it's extremely wasteful and inefficient to have on-street parking because if you need more than the street provides, what do you do? Like, there's no more. I guess you can build your off-street parking lots, but people don't want to use them because you have to pay for those. So they're going to drive around the block hoping that they find a free public parking spot. So it's wasteful in that way. Uh, but it's also wasteful in the sense that you have guaranteed this whole lane of traffic just for parking. And what if no one wants to park today? Again, it's wasteful. It's totally inelastic. When you see this machine, or when I saw it, I thought, this is perfectly elastic. Look, someone's got like, I don't know, 100 square feet that they decided to capitalize by uh, renting it out for parking. And now they find, whoop, there's more demand than supply. We need more parking spots. Just roll in a little car elevator, OK? And then what if they need to add another parking spot? They just get another one. Mind blown. My mind was blown, at least. It's a great article, too. You should read the, read the perverse effects of on-street parking if you're into it. He gives a much better explanation than I did. Oh, OK. Let's see if this goes. This is a video here. Are we going to get audio out of the, the machine here? Uh, it, you know what? Let's, let's not worry about it now. It's OK. Or do we have it? OK. Were you able to hear that? Let me try once more. OK, so for as long as I can remember, I've been very sensitive to audio and just loudness. And every time a, uh, a siren or a fire truck goes by, I have to cover my ears because I just hate how loud it is. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a very pleasant noise. Didn't have to cover my ears for this one. OK, uh, like I said, this is a, just a random slideshow. So let me circle back to what I said about uh, Japanese designing systems that reduce your stress, is how I would put it. I still remember when I was younger, and I'd come out, out of a subway in New York City, and I didn't know which direction I was facing or where I had to go. So I know I was in the right neighborhood, but I didn't know if I need to go left or right. So that problem has been solved with cell phones today, but the Japanese solved it a long time ago just by putting maps everywhere. You come out of the subway, and you're going to have a map that tells you where you are. And it's not just a subway. Uh, when you're taking the train from the airport, Narita, uh, I was coming from Ueno. This is just the back of my train seat. There's a map on the back of my train seat that tells me what car I'm in and where I am relative to the direction the train is going, where the AED is, and the bathrooms, et cetera. It's pretty cool. Here's another one. So I showed you a photo of my capsule hotel room. There's a map inside of that little, you know, I don't know how many cubic meters it was, the, the tiny little room that I stayed in. It's got a map on the wall, so I know where I have to go if I want to go to the bathroom. It's amazing. That's true. There's actually a lot of English signage. Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, here's another sort of a map. The subway systems in Tokyo serve a ton of people, like a million people a day in some of these stations. It's huge. And when you have a million people a day moving through a small space, uh, efficiency is very important. So. Yeah, here you can see there's a sign that says keep to the right. Again, it's in English. Uh, but here, I wanted to juxtapose these photos so you can see it's not a consistent pattern. It's not like we drive on the left side of the road, so you walk on the left side of the street. It varies based on the layout of the place you're in for efficiency. At least I assume it's for efficiency. So here we go left down the stairs, but here we would have kept to the right. Here's something else to see. Uh, I'll get to that. Yeah. Right here. There are a lot of accommodations for people who don't have good sight. So say you're coming up on the steps. You don't want to trip because you can't see them. So we've just got a little you know, tactile pattern. Now you know that you're about to come to the steps. If I go back, you'll see here too. So they're not always this lovely, but you see these all over the place. Yeah. It's very clean. OK, here, I don't know if I coined this term, but 
I'm going to claim that I did. I call this manners propaganda. People are very polite in Japan, in my experience. Uh, but there's a lot of signage that tells you to be polite. So I don't know if it was the, I don't know which comes first. But you'll see this all over the place. So here, here's a sign that's saying like, look, oh, here's a, a nice salary man. He's gotten up and he's inviting this woman with child to take his seat. Very polite thing to do. I didn't, I resisted the impulse to put uh, a comparison photo from San Francisco up here, wrap it up. But the, the manners propaganda I see here is very much like the government does not believe that you're very smart and it has to talk in all caps so that you know what to do. Like federal law requires that you get up out of your seat for people who need it. But no, here it's like it would be the nice thing to do if you got up out of your seat, so why don't you do it? Uh, there's signage telling you exactly where your train is going to stop, so there's no ambiguity about where to stand when the train's coming, and they always stop in the same place, because it just makes sense, right? Like, wh why introduce a random variable there? Just stop it in the same fucking spot. <laughs> oh, I have to play this one. I have to wrap up. Let me just show you this. So this is right above the train door. This tells you what car you're in and where you are in relation to the exit. Brilliant. I'm an Apple geek, so I get a kick out of this, but that was a very smooth experience. Uh, and that's how you pay for transit, and also your fast food, and your hotel, and whatever else you want that accepts Suica, and everything accepts Suica in Japan, at least in Tokyo. Suica has the transit card for Tokyo. There are a few different ones. And here's my last slide. You can get butter coffee with MCT oil at 7-Eleven in Tokyo. I don't know, did I run over questions or is there question time? I don't know if you have questions, but if you do, I'm happy to answer if I can. Yes. Oh, oh, sorry. The question was, do people still ride their bicycles on the sidewalk in Japan? Answer is yes. But there are signs in, I wish I put the photo up now. Uh, there's one place where I saw it. There's actually a speed bump for bicycles, but it's not a bump. It's it's a wiggle. It's like a question mark shape to slow down the bicycle on the sidewalk. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there, certainly there are like audio systems for the blind when they're crossing a street. Very common. Oh man. Yeah, I, and just. Just to like tie that into the theoretical picture I was painting, uh, I, I think the ADA is great because everyone has the risk of getting injured and uh, you know needing those things. And like everyone, heaven forbid, but everyone could go blind. And if you know that your society has good, you know, safety net for people who are blind, you don't have to worry so much about it. Did you visit Yokohama? No, I didn't. Oh, sorry. Did I visit Yokohama? No, I did not. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah, there, there are these rumble paths all over the sidewalks in Tokyo. Yeah. Oh. All right, thanks, everybody.